Welcome back to the Wednesday edition of Daily Thunder, and we are continuing our study in overcoming apathy. This week, I'd really like to focus on God's heart for revival. I know that revival is something so many of us are praying for and longing for, both in our country and in the church today. Before we dive into that, let's do a quick review of the last couple of sessions that we've done on overcoming apathy. First week that we went into this topic, we talked about gaining God's heart for the modern church. It's really easy to become disgusted and feel like, you know, God is just gonna vomit this lukewarm church out of his mouth and that's the end of the story. But God hasn't given up on the modern church and neither should we. And one of the most powerful things that we can do as modern believers to see that process of revival begin in the modern church is to say, Lord, let it begin with me and allow him to turn, turn that searchlight inward into our own souls and begin to refine us as gold refined in the fire. And then we talked about overcoming spiritual apathy by gaining lasting spiritual passion. It is actually God's intent that we would keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord, not that it would come and go like an emotional high. So we talked about Jesus' counsel in the book of Revelation where he it counsels us to anoint our eyes with eye salve, to pray that prayer, Lord, give me eyes to see what you see. He talks about being clothed in his righteousness, his white garments, instead of our own self-righteousness. And in beginning to apply that counsel to our daily life will lead to a personal revival and eventually lead to revival within the church if we really take those, those words of Jesus seriously. So as we talk about revival, can revival really come to the modern church and to modern society? Many of us feel a, lot of, feel a lot of helplessness as we see the world around us just rapidly heading toward darkness. But the reality is that we are not helpless. In fact, we can become catalysts for revival in our own communities if we make ourselves available to God. I would like to share two practical ways that we can help spark revival in our communities and in our churches and in our nation. And the first one is this, we need to discover the power of wrestling prayer. So in addition to everything we've already been talking about in this study of letting God refine us, letting God purify us, and opening our eyes to see what he sees and adopting his burdens and making sure that we are abiding in him and being clothed in his righteousness and not leaning on our own righteousness. In addition to all of those things, we have to discover the power of wrestling prayer. It's so easy to look around at the modern church and just cluck our tongues without really getting on our faces and crying out to God for him to do a mighty work. I mentioned in one of our previous lessons about the Isle of Lewis went through an incredible revival in the early 1900s. This was in Scotland. It's called the Hebrides Revival. And it all began with this two, with these two little old ladies, Peggy and Christine Smith. They were both in their 80s, they were sisters, and they couldn't really even leave their homes because they were in poor health. One of them was blind and one of them was hunched over. So you think of these frail little old ladies, yet they had a passion for revival on their island. They were seeing apathy in the church, they were seeing apathy in the communi community, and they decided they were going to start praying, and they began to cry out to God from their own homes in the, in the difficulties that they were in. They began to cry out to God to begin to awaken this apathetic community that they lived in. They got the local minister on board. He began to meet with a group of farmers in a barn and pray like every Tuesday and Friday night for revival. And every time that these ladies knew that this group of men had gathered in the barn to pray, they would pray themselves all night from like 10 p.m. to 4 in the morning. How in the world could these 80-year-old women do that? But their passion for revival was so great. And because of their spiritual fervor, because they understood wrestling prayer, God began to do a mighty work. And I, I shared in one of our previous lessons about how there were, there were a group of young people in a pub, you know, dancing and drinking, and the power of God just sort of fell on them where they just realized, okay, we don't want to be living like this anymore. And they ran to the church and they got on their faces and they said, we want to be right with God. We want to invite Jesus in our life. We want to forsake this, this sinful stronghold that we've been committing our lives to. We want to commit our lives to Jesus Christ. Only a work of God's spirit can do that. And it came, it was sparked through wrestling prayer from these two old ladies and all the men that then joined them in prayer. And so prayer is not something that should be an afterthought. It's not something that we should just do casually. It's actually one of our greatest spiritual tools to see revival happen in our churches, our communities, and in our nation. 
there was a man named John Hyde whose nickname was John Praying Hyde and he would wrestle in prayer for God's purposes to be accomplished. He would pray for the salvation of others. He would pray for incredible breakthroughs to happen in his, his community and his, in the churches of his community. And he prayed for missions, just incredible things that he wrestled in prayer for. And he began to really just dedicate his life to wrestling prayer. And he made a statement that it has always really convicted me. He said early in the morning at four or five o'clock and late at night to 12 or one o'clock in college or at parties at home, I used to keep such hours for myself and for pleasure. Can I not do as much for God and souls? Wow, that is so convicting because we often think nothing of, you know, staying up late to go to a party or to watch a movie. Would we consider staying up late to pray, to wrestle in prayer for God's purposes to be accomplished in our communities, churches, and in our nation? Are we willing to follow in the footsteps of Peggy and Christine Smith and John praying Hyde? One of the most common tactics of the enemy is to cause us to become passive in our praying for those around us, for the lost, for the unsaved. If you have a burden for specific people in your life, you need to realize that that burden is not there by accident. There's something you can do other than just sort of shake your head sadly at the spiritual state of their soul. You can wrestle in prayer for them. And this is something that can make an eternal impact in their life. To wrestle in prayer for the soul of another person is to get in step with God. I love this verse from 1 John. It says, if anyone sees his brother sending a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin. So this is actually a burden on God's heart as well. He said, if you see someone who is entrenched in sin, you're not supposed to just sit back idly. You need to ask, you need to pray, you need to seek for God's purpose to, for purposes to be accomplished. In all of the great revivals, it began with prayer. There's an incredible story from R.A. Torrey, who was an evangelist who went over to England in the early 1900s. And he began to lead revival meetings and people said, you know, there's no way this spiritually dead City is going to be excited about revival meetings. He rented out this huge auditorium and they said, you know, the only way people are going to come is if you have a circus act or an opera singer. You know, that was the kind of the pop culture thing of the day. And he said, no, we are going to pray. So he and his team that were with him, they prayed morning, noon, and night. They cried out to God for him to do a mighty work in the city. And on opening night, when they had their first revival meeting, they had a completely full auditorium with people standing outside in the rain waiting to get in. They had to go to two services and this went on night after night for multiple weeks, all because of the power of prayer. So prayer is not something that we should look at as like, oh, we can only pray. This is maybe the reason that you are having a burden right now for the lost in your life, for the apathetic believers all around you for this nation. Secondly, in addition to wrestling prayer, we need to gain God's burden for souls. We need to ask God for his burden. It's similar to that, that prayer that we talked about in the last lesson, Lord, give me eyes to see what you see. And one of the things that God sees is the unsaved because he does not want those unsaved people to be unreached with the gospel. Remember when I talked about the story of C.T. Studd, his father went to D.L. Moody and said, well, do I have to give up theater and cards and parties and this and that? And D.L. Moody said to him, it's not that you necessarily have to give those things up, but pretty soon you won't care about those things anymore because your passion will be going after souls. We cannot be effective in reaching this world with the gospel unless we ask God to give us his burden for lost souls. Now this has to be a supernatural work within us because human compassion is going to fall short. A number of years ago, we released a video through our website called it Praved Indifference. And it was all about how easy it is to overlook the cry of the poor and the least and the outcast and just become so preoccupied with our own lives, maybe care for a few minutes and then let that burden grow cold. That indifference is such a great enemy to our effectiveness in the kingdom of God. We need to ask for God's burden daily. We have to pray that prayer. Lord, open my eyes to the lost souls around me, the 150,000 that are dying every day without knowing you. Jesus gave that advice to the lukewarm church, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So how often do we, are we actually praying that prayer? Lord, give me eyes to see what you see. If you could use an infusion of spiritual strength in your life, begin to pray that prayer. And you'll be amazed at how God begins to work really powerfully in your life. One of the things that God sees is the lost and dying souls all around us, the souls that we often overlook because of our own busyness and selfishness and distraction. It says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
God is not willing that any should perish. His burden is for these 150,000 that are dying every day without knowing him. What are we willing to do to take up that burden? What are we willing to do to see them rescued? Have you ever stopped to really evaluate what is your greatest ambition in this life? I was really convicted when I read this story about William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army. And when he went to visit King Edward VII, he signed the guest book as he entered the palace. And this is what he wrote, Your Majesty, some men's ambition is art, some men's ambition is fame, some men's ambition is gold. My ambition is the souls of men. Wow. We think we have all these important dreams and pursuits and desires and we want to do this thing and do that thing. But if we're really in step with God, our greatest ambition is going to be the lost souls in this world. William Booth's wife, Catherine Booth, said also some very powerful things about reaching lost souls. She said, if your neighbors were sick of some devastating plague and you could go and help them, would you not do it? Would you say, I am a woman, I cannot go? Or would you say, I'm too young or too old or too busy? No, you would say, let me go. Like Miss Nightingale did to the sick and wounded soldiers, let me go. And these are not the bodies, but the souls. They are dying. They are going to an eternal death. Will you not rise up? I can't read those quotes without feeling convicted. Not that we rise up in our own strength and say, okay, this is just an obligation. I just need to do this because I'm a Christian. As we abide in Christ, as we spend time in his presence, as we are captivated by him, as we cultivate that spiritual fervor that we've been talking about during this series, that's when that burden, that passion to reach souls becomes the natural outflow of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's another powerful quote from Hudson Taylor that really, really brings it home. He said, perhaps if there were more of that intense distress for souls that leads to tears, we should more frequently see the results we desire. Sometimes it may be that while we are complaining of the hardness of our hearts of those we are seeking to benefit, the hardness of our own hearts and our feeble apprehension of the solemn reality of eternal things may be the true cause of our want of success. And that is again, like saying, okay, Lord, send a revival, but let it begin with me. I don't want to be standing in the way of what you are trying to do because I'm letting my own coldness or hardness of heart cloud my vision to see what you're seeing. Now, if you find that your heart is cold, that you don't have a real compassion or concern for the lost souls around you, ask God for that burden. Don't let your heart become indifferent. Pray for that burden until it becomes your reality. Remember that winning souls for Jesus Christ is your primary calling in this life. William Booth used to say that he would love to be able to, the, the, the men and women that he was training to share the gospel, he'd love for them to be able to hang over hell for 24 hours and hear the screams so that they would have that burning passion to reach the lost. And that's something that God can give us if we simply ask him for it. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. This is something he has commanded us to do. It is a primary part of our calling as his children. So the key truth is that the only way to begin to carry God's burden for lost souls is to live in an attitude of complete surrender, of consecration to Jesus Christ. This is an attitude that says, my life is not my own. I have been bought with a price. For example, it's the same attitude that Betty Scott Stamm had when she wrote these words in her journal at the age of 18. Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all, utterly to thee to be thine forever. Fill me and seal me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou wilt. Send me where thou wilt. Work out thy whole will in my life at any cost. She wrote those words in her journal at the age of 18. She went on to become a missionary to China after she was married, and she and her husband were, were both martyred for the sake of the gospel. Their death inspired hundreds or thousands of Christians to boldly go and proclaim the gospel all around the world. In fact, her life had a tremendous impact on Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. That is the attitude we have to have because if we're holding anything back, if we're clinging to our own rights and expectations, we will not really be able to carry the burdens of God. It might be a scary prayer to pray, especially when you hear stories of the martyrs, and yet God so beautifully used even this death. It was a triumphant death, John and Betty Stam, and it inspired the, the, the idea of going and winning souls for Jesus Christ at any cost, and that is the way we need to live. Whether we're called to go overseas or whether we're called to martyrdom or not, we need to live with that kind of willingness. So what if the concept of winning souls feels overwhelming? 
you remember, you don't have to go across the world to lead others to Jesus. You can ask God to show you who you can Im impact right now starting today. And sometimes it is being faithful with what's right in front of us before God is going to entrust us with something more. A lot of times these people are right in our own families. It's easy to overlook them and we think, oh, we know they're never gonna change, so we'll turn our attention elsewhere. But a lot of times God has us in that family with that person for a very specific reason. As Catherine Booth said, there is one soul that you have more influence with than any other person on earth, some soul or souls. Are you doing all you can for their salvation? Your relatives, friends, acquaintances are to be rescued from the depths of sin, degradation, and woe. Let them see the tears in your eyes, or if you cannot weep, let them hear the tears in your voice and let them realize that you feel their danger and are in distress for them. God will give his Holy Spirit and they will be saved. What a powerful reminder. A lot of times these people are in our own families, our own communities. Sometimes they're right outside our front door. I've often told the true story of a man named Frank Jenner who ran a little shop on George Street in Sydney, Australia. And his goal was to share the gospel very simply with about 10 people every day. He had these little tracts he gave out and he just asked a challenging question. If you were to die, would you go to heaven or hell? Would you think about that? Gave them a tract and went on with his day. And he committed to doing this for all of his life. And, and this one pastor began to hear these testimonies all around the world of people who were so arrested by this question, what, what would happen if you died tonight, when they were on George Street in Sydney, Australia, that they went and sought out a Christian and gave their lives to Jesus Christ and then went on to be in ministry. And this pastor went to visit Frank Jenner at the end of his life, and it was estimated that simply by going out his front door and speaking to others about Jesus every single day, he reached, personally reached, about 100,000 people over his lifetime, which is incredible. And a lot of those gave their lives to Christ and then went on to be ministers for the gospel. So this is a man who never went overseas. He never did anything really huge that would be notable, that people would write a book about. And yet think of the impact that he had simply by saying, Lord, I'm willing, I'm available. Give me your burden for souls. Now remember, a burden for souls is not something we can rise up to in our own strength. We have to go after God's grace. If you have a burden for revival, remember that God's burden for revival is far greater than yours. When you pray for your church, your community, and your nation, your nation to be revived and awakened to God, you are praying in step with God's heart and God's spirit. So that is a powerful encouragement. Let's ask God to give us that passion for wrestling prayer and to give us his burden for the lost souls around us. And that is the first step towards seeing revival happen today. God bless.